Chapter 23 Shoot the Leader During the best part of an hour, Harry stuffed himself with food and only stopped when he had consumed everything he could find. He was a sturdy little man with straight jet black hair and eyes with a much white surrounding the iris. For a time, he sat there looking into the fire. Then, between puffs from endless cigarettes, he gave out his story in short, jerky sentences. He had hurried from the camp laden only with rifle, raincoat, and a small sack of food. Taking the trail of the five wolves, he found that it led almost straight down the valley, along the left bank of the river. Most of the day, amid the falling flakes, he had doggedly shuffled along on his homemade snowshoes, cautiously enough to avoid again scaring the wary animals, yet swiftly enough to prevent them from getting so far ahead that the snow might blot out their tracks. When the light began to fail, he stopped for the night under the protecting branches of a very old spruce. Here he lit a fire, and with the great mass of green spruce twigs heaped around him, and with his raincoat as a blanket, he spent the night comfortably enough. Anyone who has not been raised in the mountains would have fared miserably, but the Indian liked this free life. All night the snow fell. By morning it was more than a foot deep. By noon it was up to the knees of the deer he encountered in the thickets. Before night it had reached the two-foot mark on his rifle barrel, which he used as a yardstick. Several things of importance had happened. He had found where the wolves had slept some time during the early part of the night. He had surprised them in their later resting place for the day, and had had time to shoot at a gray one which was so inquisitive as to stop and look back at him. The hasty shot had gone wide of the mark. By good luck, however, he had killed two spruce grouse, not with the rifle, but by throwing sticks at them as they perched in low willows. The wolves, he thought, would realize their danger and try to put many miles between him and them before they slowed up, but as the snow was beginning to fall more lightly, he did not worry much about this. Toward evening, he came to a glade where more moose were feeding than he had ever seen together. The willows grew here profusely, and the big animals black against the snow, were tearing down the branches as they bit off the more tender twigs. Two were old-timers with colossal antlers which could thrill the heart of an ordinary hunter, but Harry had seen many moose in his life. He merely noted that the beast had not been disturbed by the wolves, and then passed on. Shortly after this he had had his first real surprise. By the tracks he learned that the wolves had not dashed away for miles at full speed. Indeed, they were traveling rather slowly. The king, however, was keeping careful watch, often running out on ledges to look back over the trail, or circling where the wind was right to give him through scent or sound an inkling of the trailer's whereabouts. Harry was puzzled. He was still more mystified than that night when he was awakened by the barking of his lost dog. Without doubt, this was directed at him, and had in it an angry quality never before noticeable. Evidently, the wolves were thoroughly alarmed, yet staying somewhere nearby. No seductive whistling could induce the former pet to come any closer, so Harry finally completed his preparations for sleep, and with both grouse safely cooked and eaten, soon began his usual loud snoring. One last heavy flurry of snow spread itself over the earth, then the stars came out, and the northern lights began to flicker and dance. Before morning, Harry was shivering, but he built a fire of dead branches torn from the jack pines and boiled some coffee in an old condensed soup can. Almost before daylight, he was again on the trail, and very soon he found that the wolves had stopped their flight long enough to hunt for food. Spreading out in the thickets, they had surprised a young deer and caught the frightened animal before it could dash through their line. Very little of the carcass remained except some hide, entrails, and such hard bones as the skull and some of the vertebrae. The Indian knew that they would not want to run far with so much food in their stomachs, 
Slowly he crept through the white forest. Moose trotted out of his way. Grouse flew loudly out of trees over his head. Sheep rattled loose stones on the ridges, but he scarcely so much as turned his eyes from the wolf trail, which ran like a winding path far ahead of him. He knew it was very fresh. He had seen the five beds from which the pack had sprung only a minute or two before he came into view from behind a tangle of young spruce trees. The bottoms of those beds had still been warm. Several miles from this spot, he came upon a split in the trail. Two wolves had turned west and broken a path for themselves. Harry saw that these at once increased the length of their strides and traveled much faster than before, showing that something had been holding them back when in the pack. The Indians studied the other tracks. First had come the big leader, breaking the trail through the snow. His mighty track was unmistakable, then a much smaller animal, easily recognizable as Harry's former dog, and last of all, a good-sized wolf, whose tracks coming on top of the others should have been plain, but in reality were indistinct and blurred by loose snow. Harry became more and more interested. He could easily guess that the last wolf which followed the others so listlessly as to drag its feet through the feathery flakes must be sick, perhaps very sick, the lack of depth in its tracks showed that it was not nearly as fat and heavy as it should be. Because the king would not desert this wolf, even though his every action showed his alarm and restlessness, it was evident that the sick one was his mate. Fresh hope spurred on the Indian. He was wise in the ways of the mountain animals, and he knew now that the great wolf's strength and speed could be measured by the failing powers of this poor poisoned female, whom he would not leave while there seemed to be any chance to save her life. The day ended in a little gorge where Harry saw several large trout of the Dolly Varden variety in a clear pool and succeeded in stabbing two of them with his knife fashioned to the end of a stick. At once he prepared to camp. The fresh fish made a good meal when well cooked by the simple method of pegging them split open on a log and propping this close to the fire to act as a heat reflector. Later, he sat with his back against a tree trunk, smoking cigarettes and listening to an owl hooting somewhere in the forest. The fire shadows danced among the snow-laden limbs and started two coyotes barking. Somewhere, miles away, a wolf howled twice. Well contented, the Indian crawled into the middle of a fresh pile of spruce twigs he had gathered and slept through the third night. Again the morning was cold. The snow was not as spotless as at first, for the mountain animals had been very busy foraging. Coyotes, lynx, and wolverines added their trails to those of the deer and the moose. Here and there, a porcupine had left his retreat and shuffled to a favorite jack pine for bark. Squirrels and rabbits had made a tracery of tracks in all the thickets, but Harry took up the wolf trail where he had left it and plodded on. Toward the middle of the day, he found where his quarry had dug the snow from a moose carcass and feasted. Nearby were their three beds, deserted and cheerless. Their trail was now turning in a gradual circle westward, and then back toward the lower valley of the Porcupine, but through country entirely new to Harry. Along the cliffs were many white goats, but rarely any sheep. Here, however, were tracks of grizzlies which had not yet holed up for the winter's sleep, and were feeding on a moose carcass in the dense timber. Harry killed three blue grouse and one white ptarmigan with sticks he threw at them. Otherwise, his day was uneventful and tiring because of a light crust on the snow. On the fifth day, he sighted the wolves. They were far ahead, mere black specks against the whiteness of a ridge. Single file as usual, the three traveled slowly along the edge of the timber. By afternoon, he had seen them many times, but when night shut down, it, the dog came back to bark and growl at him in the safe blackness. That night he ate porcupine and the remainder of his bread. The sixth day found the wolves moving very slowly. They had gained almost nothing during the night. The leader's tracks showed how he circled and fretted on account of the lagging pace, yet always came back to the gray mate. Suddenly Harry looked up and saw them distinctly ahead. Up went his rifle. The king was in front of the others, 
bounding now to gain to the timber. Harry dared not to shoot, for if by mistake he killed the mate, the king would certainly start on a tireless dash into the wilds of the north. Glimpses like this came again and yet again. Each time the dog and the gray were between him and the mighty black. Harry tried to circle around them in the timber, but was always discovered by either the dog or the watchful black. At such times, the dog would bark fiercely and irritate the Indian to the point of wanting to shoot her. This idea soon became uppermost in his mind, and when the chance did finally come to shoot one of the three, it was the dog that he fiercely picked out for his revenge. The shot rang out and echoed against the rocks, and then was drowned out by yelps as Harry's former pet, wounded only slightly in the back, but badly scared, stampeded off at right angles and went bounding toward the river. The black and the gray leaped straight ahead and vanished quickly in the timber. Now they were coming to the mountains familiar to Harry, winding along the easiest game paths in the general direction of the camp. Every half mile or so, there was a depression in the snow where the gray had thrown herself down to rest until the ceaseless vigilance of the black would lead to the detection of the stealthily approaching Indian. Then away they would go again, the king breaking a trail in which the others rarely traveled, unable any longer to ascend steep banks or ridges, and so forcing the leader to keep in the valley and head steadily toward territory he feared. When night came, they were only three or four miles from the camp, in a forest jammed with windfalls. They were about twice that distance from the ranger's cabin on the other side of the river, where Harry knew that Johnny was staying while making a map of some timber areas. The Indian left the trail here and made a detour to reach the camp without driving the wolves any farther. He felt sure that they would lie down and rest somewhere nearby for most of the night, if not so close to the men and dogs as to be frightened by the sound of voices or barking. Harry's story worked miracles in the camp. No one thought any more of sleep, Rifles were examined, snowshoes overhauled, and heavy fighting collars put on the dogs. Jones could scarcely wait until morning came. Up and down he walked, nervously throwing more wood on the fire, or perhaps for the hundredth time trying to light a pipe in which he'd forgotten to put tobacco. At first signs of dawn, the other men clustered around Harry, who was calmly eating a good breakfast while they fidgeted. At length, the Cree laid aside his empty plate, lit a cigarette, took up his gun, looked at the brightening sky, and said the magic words, Now we go. The excited dogs were let loose and held back of the men by cracking of whips and harsh threats from Steve. Grimly, the little army moved through the trees. Presently, light rain began to fall. It was just a drizzle, but it froze as it fell and coated everything with ice. Harry, striding silently ahead, full of the importance of his present position, was the only one who really enjoyed the walk, for Jones was soon panting with the exertion and complaining about having too many clothes. And complaining about having too many clothes. Steve was nearly crazy from the trouble he'd had with the eight dogs, and old Jim was suffering from rheumatism in his left leg. Then suddenly the Indian stooped down and showed them the wolf tracks. Whatever you do, cautioned Jim, don't shoot the gray female before you make sure of the big one. I'm with Harry on that. If you do, you'll never in the world get another chance at his scalp. Jones and Steve nodded agreement. We'll follow until we hit fresher tracks, continued Jim. Then the dogs can go ahead with Harry and Mr. Jones, while Steve and I try to butt in on the chase whenever there is any circling. Remember, shoot the leader. Twenty minutes later, they found the wolves' beds under a windfall. Tracks in several directions showed that the king had gone off to stand guard or hunt food while the gray rested. Later in the night, he had come back to rest near her. A wail from one of the dogs showed that the scent here was fresh. Let them try the trail, suggested Jones. They needed no urging. In a moment, all eight were floundering through the crusted snow, yelping joyously and sticking to the wolf tracks like a well-trained sled team. Harry hurried up the nearest bear ridge to have a look ahead. 
Soon his whistle caught the attention of the others who were in the thick timber. He was frantically waving with one hand and pointing toward the river with the other. Jones and Steve began to run in that direction. They came out on an open meadow just in time to see the two wolves entering the far edge of the woods, leaping high over the snow. "'Shoot the leader!' cried Steve. Both men hastily aimed and fired. "'I hit him!' Jones yelled. "'I know I did!' They hurried to the spot where the wolves had disappeared. The tracks were easily found, and sure enough, there was blood, little drops of it. Steve gave gruff shouts for the dogs. Presently, they came running across the meadow, black and white ones, yellows and grays. They rushed around in circles, at first looking for the wolves, and then seeing nothing of them, began to use their noses again and settle down to trailing. In a few minutes, there was a great burst of barking. Steve and Harry ran ahead, the two others following as fast as they could. What they saw was the king running along inside of the treeless ridge in plain view of the pack which raced after him but on a lower level. There was something so deliberate about the way he showed himself and loped along that both men guessed at once he was decoying the dogs away from his mate, who no doubt had reached the end of her strength and was hiding somewhere in the windfalls. Steve, pushing hard and a bit excited, threw up his rifle, and at three hundred yards sent shot after shot whizzing just over or under the wolf, while Harry watched through his binoculars and grunted at each miss. "'You never hit,' the Indian calmly remarked as he replaced the glasses in their case. "'But the wolf's already wounded in the left hind leg. Perhaps we get him.' 